So I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this community of practice call on coordinated outreach and using technology. We know that a strong, coordinated, housing-focused outreach is really an essential element in ending homelessness. So on this call, we're going to be highlighting some available resources to support your outreach efforts. And we're going to hear from two communities from Niagara Region, Ontario and Kelowna, BC, who'll be sharing their early efforts, learnings and challenges as they've begun to coordinate a map outreach, including their experience with using technology in that process. My name is Marie Morrison and I'm joined today by Lisa Bell as your host for today. We are the Improvement Advisors for Kelowna and Niagara Region and are excited about the work these two communities have been doing in coordinating outreach and thought that others would also like to learn and hear about their journey to date. So a super big thank you to our panelists, uh, Malcolm and Carla and Mackenzie for taking the time to prepare your presentations and for being really vulnerable in sort of the ups and downs and the learnings that you've had along the way. Um, I'm sure that folks on the call today are really going to appreciate and have a lot to learn from your successes as well as any fail forward moments. Also on the call with us today is Ian DeYoung of ORCODE. I invited him, given his experience and expertise in outreach, to join in the conversation at the end of the call and just listen in. And he's really expressed that his interest in joining is to learn along with everyone else. And so thanks for joining us today, Ian. Lisa and I uh, work with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness that leads a national movement of individuals, organizations and communities working together to end homelessness in Canada. And uh, both Niagara Region and Kelowna are part of the Built for Zero Canada movement. Our session today is part of a series of CH monthly webinars and community practice calls that have been taking place since the fall of 2019 to support communities' efforts to implement by name lists and coordinated access. You can find all the webinars and community practice calls, both those coming up and the previous ones that we've had on the CH training and technical assistance website. These webinars and community practice calls are being funded in part by the Government of Canada through Reaching Home. And today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent over the next day or so to everyone who registered and will also shortly be included on the TTA website previously mentioned. Everyone on the call today is muted, but we really encourage you to use the chat to communicate and uh, to put your questions into the question function. Today, we're really hoping to share key resources and learnings and insights from communities so that you can leave with some ideas that you can action back in your community and really know where you can find additional information and resources. Agenda today, we've uh, done some introductions. We'll do some more detailed introductions of our presenters in a moment. I do wanna just cover very quickly, again, where you can find some resources and then we'll have our community presentations and hopefully uh, some good time at the end for question and answer and reflections. So in terms of some of those key resources, we all know outreach is a critical component of, of your coordinated access system. And here you can see number six on the coordinated access scorecard coverage and access points. Uh, so not only does outreach help ensure coverage across your geographic area, but also in being able to make contact with those who are unsheltered or not otherwise uh, being connected or connecting to services. And outreach should be seen really and operate as a coordinated access point within your system and be coordinated with those other coordinated access points. Uh, here you can see the by name list scorecard. So this is really where the detail of, of outreach is being outlined. Um, and you can see question number two here is related to unsheltered homelessness, because again, we know outreach efforts are essential to ensuring that your by name list is comprehensive and includes those experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And you're looking to ensure that you have complete coverage, that you're avoiding unnecessarily duplication and able to prioritize your efforts. And in doing so should have a clear understanding of your community hotspots. You should have a mapping of all the outreach programs that exist in your community and then looking to coordinate those efforts across those programs and, and with the understanding of your hotspots. And then to document uh, the outreach that you're doing, whether that be in a map, spreadsheet of services, kind of a written schedule, um, or otherwise policy protocols of your outreach structure and practices. 
The By Name List Scorecard comes with a guide that includes further information and tips and resources. And I do want to point out just two key um, resources that we have put together, just kind of a, a, a summary of uh, key considerations for coordinating your outreach coverage, along with uh, some service mapping tools, so some spreadsheet options that you can copy and customize as you need. There is also a whole website page dedicated to pulling together information, both on uh, information on outreach, but also sample materials from communities such as frameworks and guidelines and policies. And there are also a set of resources related to encampments that is not exclusively about, about outreach, but uh, always involves outreach. And this information is included on the Canadian Shelter Transformation Network website in a drop down on the resources page. And that includes uh, the draft encampment toolkit, for which I just wanted you to note that we are looking for written feedback on until the end of February before it gets finalized. And there's also there you'll see a series of encampment webinars that took, pla that, uh, took place this last year. So uh, with no further ado, we're going to start to uh, hear from our communities and I want to give you a uh, more detailed introduction to Malcolm. He is driven by a passion for social justice and a thirst for system level change. He began working in the homelessness service sector after graduating with a BA in poli sci at the, science, at the University of uh, British Columbia in the Okanagan. And over the fat last four years, he's progressed from a frontline shelter worker with Kelowna Gospel Mission to an outreach worker and eventual team lead at the Kelowna Friendship Society. And in March of 2020, he moved to his current position as senior homeless outreach navigator with the Canadian Mental Health Association Kelowna, where he leads a staff team of nine. He is currently completing his Master of Public Safety uh, through Wilfrid Laurier University. He is the chair of Kelowna's a coordinated outreach table where he seeks to establish increased communication and coordination across the outreach organizations in his community. And I know that uh, definitely Malcolm and Kelowna as a whole has really been leaning into some key mindsets about around being action focused uh, and being okay with failing forward and really adopting a growth mindset. And so very excited uh, to have uh, Malcolm share more with you. So Malcolm, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning from Kelowna. Thanks so much for having me today, Marie, and thank you for the introduction. I would like to begin my presentation by acknowledging that I live and work on the traditional unceded territory of the Okanagan Silk people. The Silk people of the Okanagan Nation are a transboundary tribe separated at the 49th parallel by the border between Canada and the United States. Their nation is comprised of seven member communities in the southern interior of British Columbia, including the Okanagan Indian Band, a Soyuz Indian Band, Penticton Indian Band, Upper Nicola Band, Upper and Lower Similkameen Indian Bands, and the West Bank First Nation, and in northern Washington state, the Colville Confederated Tribes. Their members share the same land in silks and language, culture, and customs. They are a distinct and sovereign nation. Next slide, please. Kelowna is a unique community in terms of both its geography and its climate. Known for having four distinct seasons, Kelowna regularly reaches 35 degrees in the summer and around minus 10 in the winter. While the variety of seasonal activities is viewed as a sort of paradise for many, our climate has serious implications for the lives of those experiencing homelessness. Among the various impacts that our weather has, summer in Kelowna sees a lot of people choose to move out of shelter and back onto the street. Due to our extensive agricultural sector, we also experience a significant influx of unsheltered individuals seeking employment at various farms and orchards throughout the valley. In terms of geography, Kelowna is one of two municipalities in the central Okanagan. Separated by Okanagan Lake and around 650 meters of bridge, the cities of Kelowna and West Kelowna share many of the same clients, and yet some service providers face funding restrictions that limit their programs to their respective city limits. While homelessness services have been available in Kelowna since 1978, 
there has been a noticeable shift over the past years from the traditional siloing done by community partners to a more integrated and cooperative approach. This shift in perspective has been further accelerated by COVID-19 and subsequent injections of funding that have bolstered service capacity, leading to increased coordination between organizations and even municipalities. So what does the experience of homelessness in Kelowna look like right now? Next slide, please. Thank you. Let's look at some numbers. In March 2020, the Central Okanagan Foundation completed its biennial point in time count that found at least 297 people were experiencing homelessness in Kelowna. It's important to note that these numbers include both sheltered and unsheltered people. There has been a 4% increase of people experiencing homelessness since 2018, and Indigenous people remain overrepresented at 21%. Kelowna also experiences considerably high rates of chronic homelessness, with 72% of those surveyed having experienced homelessness for six months or more within the past year. As an outreach provider, my focus is on those experiencing unsheltered homelessness. So what does Kelowna look like in terms of sheltered versus unsheltered homelessness? Currently, Kelowna has three permanent shelters with a combined bed count of 138. We also just found out that there will be an additional permanent shelter opening on February 1st with 38 beds. Of these four shelters, two accept all genders, one is female only, and one is male only. All of our permanent shelters offer case management for their clients, highlighting the need for increased communication between shelter providers and outreach providers. As we all know, the journey from experiencing homelessness to achieving housing is not linear in nature. As such, many of our clients move between being sheltered and unsheltered throughout the days, months, and years. Currently, there is no formal system for communicating from shelter to shelter or shelter to outreach provider regarding the work that has been done with a client towards achieving their case goals. In my opinion, this is an important opportunity for collaboration to help prevent overlap and promote efficiency in our sector. In addition to our permanent shelters, cold weather shelters are opened every winter. This year, we had two shelters open with a combined total of 89 beds. As expected, during the periods that these shelters are open, there is a significant reduction in the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. For many, it is a welcome reprieve from the harsh reality of the outdoors. Unfortunately, come springtime, these shelters close down, resulting in a plethora of difficulties and negative consequences for the people finding themselves, once again, displaced. Next slide, please. In fall 2019, the City of Kelowna recognized their legal obligation to provide an outdoor space for people to legally camp in the absence of adequate shelter space. This recognition resulted in the creation of two outdoor sheltering sites, referred to as OS1 and OS2. Due to the fact that OS2 was located in an area next to the lake and with limited shelter from the wind, the site ended up never being utilized. OS1, on the other hand, provided much better shelter from the elements, including a warming tent that individuals could access on an as-needed basis. While OS1 was well accessed, the agreement with the property owners came to an end in the summer of 2020, and the site required relocation. This brings us to OS3. While well-intentioned in its design, this current site missed the mark in several different ways. First, the site was graded with gravel and is extremely uncomfortable to sleep on. Secondly, there are, again, no natural wind barriers on the site. This makes the location quite cold for individuals without tarps or artificial barriers. Thirdly, there is no on-site storage options for when the site closes during the day. This means that anyone accessing the site is required to pack up and take their supplies with them every morning and set them back up every night. As a result of these shortcomings, OS3 is severely underutilized with about three to five people accessing every night, despite room for about 20 to 25 people. Let's take a look at unsheltered homelessness outside of designated sheltering sites. 
As previously mentioned, unsheltered homelessness in Kelowna is directly impacted by the opening of cold weather shelters during the winter. This graph is a representation of daily counts performed by bylaw between June 2019 and January 2021 of the total number of people sleeping outside in key areas of the community. While this data is a sample of the total unsheltered homeless population, anecdotally, it seems to reflect what we have been seeing on the streets. Due to increased shelter capacity, we are hovering around 15 to 20 unsheltered individuals per night. Data visualization can offer profound insight into the work that we do. Not only does this graph clearly show the impact that cold weather shelters have on outdoor sheltering numbers, you can also see a downward trend in unsheltered homelessness during 2020 compared to the overall upward trend in late 2019. More research is required to begin to understand the causal relationships affecting the data. Is the development of supportive housing a contributing factor for the downward trend? Perhaps CERB and increased MSDPR payments allowed people to secure previously unaffordable housing. I don't claim to know the answers at this point, but I do know that there is much to learn. So what does engagement with unsheltered individuals look like in Kelowna? Outreach in Kelowna is a melting pot of 20 organizations with different funding, priorities, staff capacities, and target areas. Some teams focus on a single service, such as providing harm reduction. Other teams have broader scopes and fulfill more of a case management role in the community. Between these 20 organizations, outreach teams cover all areas of both Kelowna and West Kelowna. Let's take a look at the type of work that each team does. As you can see, outreach work in Kelowna has become fragmented into hyper-focused teams working within a niche to catch all organizations and everything in between. The consequences of such fragmentation include siloing, reduced efficiency, lack of identity, and a failure to understand where your organization fits within the homelessness services system as a whole. Informal communication between teams has been occurring for quite some time. Due to our small and interwoven community, staff move from organization to organization, bringing with them previous relationships and connections. The result, however, is an environment where it is easier to provide services to a client when you know the staff at other organizations personally. Organizations with staff who are less connected to the community have a harder time navigating the system and their clients struggle as a result. So how do we address this? Our goal is to establish formal means of collaboration and a communication between all outreach providers in both Kelowna and West Kelowna. COVID-19 has launched our initiatives into orbit. As a result of the current pandemic, organizations have rallied around each other and established community outreach schedules that outline each team's target areas, times and days of service, contact information, and the types of services they provide. The City of Kelowna has begun providing resources to aid outreach efforts in the form of staff and tech support. Weekly meetings have been established for the coordination of outreach and the coordination of shelter providers. The walls surrounding service providers are finally starting to come down, and it is an extremely exciting time to be involved in the sector. The use of technology for outreach purposes is still in its infancy in Kelowna. Significant progress was made in fall 2020 when the city of Kelowna committed resources to converting their GIS system called ArcGIS to an app that can be used to track encampments and unsheltered individuals. Next slide, thank you. This screenshot shows a section of the rail trail, a high traffic area for encampments. At its core, our implementation of ArcGIS allowed for outreach workers and community organizations to drop pins when they found a new encampment and subsequently fill in basic information about who is staying in the encampment, what their needs are, which organization last visited the encampment and when, and if there were any critical needs. The idea behind this implementation was to allow for rapid mobilization of outreach teams to new encampments in the community. 
Bylaw was usually the first group to identify new encampments, and we wanted services to know where the encampments were and to record when services were engaged. Beyond this function, we wanted to ensure that there was clarity around which outreach teams were interacting with what camps in order to reduce overlap and service engagement fatigue. Pins identifying encampments were color-coded according to whether they were new and required service engagement or whether there were critical needs present at the camp. On these fronts, the app was useful and successful. Unfortunately, there was a critical aspect of our utilization of the app that ultimately led to its demise. The city of Kelowna held the license for ArcGIS and was responsible for the storage of backend data. While this enabled the city to provide development and support resources, there were no formal agreements in place that allowed for the city to store identified client information. As a result, program users were required to use numerical identifiers for clients in the app instead of their names. A secondary organization held a by name list that attributed a unique identifier when a client was added to it. This meant that outreach teams would first be required to add a client to a separate by name list, wait for the identifier to be issued, then enter that identifier into the ArcGIS system. If this sounds confusing, that's because it was. As a result of this confounded data entry process, there was a slow uptake in the use of the app and rapid user fatigue. Beyond these user interface issues, minor discrepancies in spelling, different aliases, and data entry errors resulted in multiple identifiers being used for the same individual. Over the course of a few months, usage of the app stopped completely. While this implementation of the app ultimately failed, important lessons were learned and alternatives for outreach coordination were explored and implemented. Enter the coordinated outreach table. After attending the incredibly informative and eye-opening Impactful Street Eb Outreach webinar by Ian DeYoung in October 2020, I was inspired to engage with the Central Okanagan Journey Home Society to get as many organizations as possible to attend. The Journey Home Society rallied around this idea and was able to facilitate the attendance of over 40 staff from 24 different organizations. Wanting to keep the momentum going, Saran, Mallinson, and myself organized 11 breakout sessions with the attendees to discuss the evolution of outreach in Kelowna and West Kelowna. The result of these breakout sessions was the creation of a 29-person working group tasked with shaping the future of outreach in our community. This working group included the RCMP, Interior Health, the Lived Experience Circle on Homelessness, and a variety of other outreach stakeholders. Our working group quickly evolved into the Coordinated Outreach Table, a weekly, hour-long meeting where we problem solve and coordinate in a collaborative setting and discuss trends, gaps, and other aspects of outreach. Our table has increased the organizational awareness and understanding of each team and has led to the sharing of resources and knowledge to the benefit of our clients. Even though our table is only two months old, we have built a strong core of attendees who trust and rely on each other to best provide outreach services to the most vulnerable members of our community. There are several key aspects to our table that I believe have contributed to its overall success and buy-in from the community. First, we have maintained consistency throughout our journey from breakout sessions to a working group to the coordinated outreach table. We provided weekly updates on our progress and pushed to maintain engagement from each member. As soon as we were ready, we began hosting weekly meetings and haven't stopped since. Rain or shine, we always have the coordinated outreach meeting. This has allowed us to maintain momentum and engagement and has created a sense of accountability for both the journey home and myself. Accountability is the second aspect of what has made our table so successful. During the breakout sessions, I specifically asked each attendee to keep me personally accountable for following through on the work that I committed to. Not only did this build trust with our members, it created an overall environment of accountability between all members, not only between myself and the table. When a member says that they will do something, we follow up at the next meeting to ensure that progress has been made. This is all made possible by the fact that we record minutes for every meeting. 
Ah, yes, meeting minutes, the third aspect of success for our table. You actually might be surprised to hear that some people love taking notes, and it's a great idea to find those people and force them to take the minutes for you. All joking aside, being able to distribute the minutes for each meeting encourages accountability, allows for the distribution of key updates, and provides a summary of the table's activity over time. An added benefit is that if a member is unable to attend, they can read up on the minutes and feel up to date for the next meeting. The coordinated outreach table continues to move forward with the intention of continually shaping outreach in our community and with the ability to quickly adapt to an ever-changing landscape. Reflecting back on the work that has been done regarding outreach coordination in my community, there are many bright spots to focus on that fit into three broad themes. Our community and the organizations within it have an intense hunger for collaboration. Some groups remain cautiously optimistic around systems level coordination. However, everyone is at the table and at least willing to try. Our hunger for working together has resulted in considerable momentum for community initiatives. From Kelowna and West Kelowna situation tables to coordinated access, coordinated shelter, and now coordinated outreach, we are establishing a critical framework for coordination in our sector. With our hunger for collaboration, our momentum, and new community groups, people are starting to see tangible impacts of our work resulting in community buy-in. This continues to strengthen the sector and increase our effectiveness. In the midst of the fantastic progress that has been made, we still face challenges, perhaps the most significant being the challenge of data sharing across organizations and the impact that this has on broader system coordination. While there is eagerness to work together, key players for coordination include BC Housing, Interior Health, the Ministry of Child and Family Development, and the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. Each of these organizations have stringent policies around data sharing and the protection of information. Establishing cohesion between all of them requires a significant amount of work and time, and I do believe that we will achieve it. We just aren't there yet. So where do we go from here? Our mid to long-term goal is to establish coordination between our three coordinated tables, coordinated outreach, coordinated shelter, and coordinated access. Between these three tables, there is service provider coverage throughout an individual's progression from unsheltered homelessness to permanent housing. If we can find a way to collaborate with one another, we can move towards a community that supports consenting individuals throughout their journey, whether they are, are evicted from supportive housing, spend winters in shelter and summers on the street, or experience a linear progression through our system. At the end of the day, the purpose of our work is to increase the effectiveness of our organizations to help house people. We can't lose sight of this. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you, Malcolm, for sharing all that. Super helpful to hear some of the context of what's happening in your community and how things have evolved. And I mean, really so quickly from what sounded like, you know, lots of agencies, not coordination to coming together and having this coordinated table and just even your learnings and the impact that's had over the last couple of months. It's exciting to hear about. Um, yeah, and Ian's putting some notes in there too. Uh, people can definitely please use the chat. Um, yeah, so I'll just read what an amazing journey Kelowna has been on, impressive lessons learned, the passion for best serving people experiencing homelessness is clear, very thoughtful and insightful. So again, thank you. Uh, we will save our questions to the end. I'm now going to turn it over to Lisa to introduce Niagara folks. Absolutely. I'm super excited to be able to introduce Carla and Mackenzie. Uh, from Niagara Region. So Carla holds a Bachelor of Business Administration and over the past few years she's excelled in various roles with the region. Uh, most recently she accepted a position as the Service System and Performance Management Advisor with Homelessness Services. Um, she brings her information management and data-driven expertise to the role and provides incredible support to the development of coordinated access. Um, I often celebrate Carla, and I know so do fellow members of the team for her inner for her innovation and drive for results. Um, and she enjoys time with her partner and her adorable son Leo. 
uh, Mackenzie, who you can see there, also enjoys time with his partner and his adorable uh, daughter, Nora. He is an outreach worker who joined the Niagara Assertive Street Outreach team in April of last year and is also attending the part-time paramedic program at Niagara College. And prior to outreach, he spent four years working in one of Niagara's largest co-ed shelters. Um, so without further ado, I pass it along to Carla and Mackenzie. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Lisa, and Bolt for Zero for hosting us today. Uh, Malcolm, I feel like we may need to chat some more after this. It's an honor presenting with you today as well. So in, the Niagara region is located in southern Ontario, Canada, between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. The region encompasses a total area of approximately 850 square meters with a population of just under 450,000. The region is comprised of 12 local area municipalities with the largest being St. Catharines and Niagara Falls. Niagara Region's homelessness response system is in a state of transformation. Through our recent April 20 procurement, we were able to streamline many program areas, including our assertive street outreach program. And in November 2020, we were able to achieve a quality by name list. So what does homelessness look like in Niagara Region? Shout out to our wonderful Built for Zero data lead, Christina, for helping me with this slide. As of January 14th, 2021, there are over a thousand individuals active on the by name list with 350 individuals or approximately one third experiencing chronic homelessness over the past year and or three years. As you can see, we're early in our Built for Zero and by name list journey. But the best part about our quality by name list is the low rate of return to homelessness from housing. The median of 15 for monthly housing move-ins is also encouraging. However, we have a lot of work to do in ending homelessness before chronicity and in reducing the movement to inactivity unnecessarily as movement back to homelessness from activity is high. In focusing in on the unsheltered data from our by name list, the majority of individuals on the by name list presenting with a most recent recorded housing type of unsheltered homelessness, encampment, makeshift vehicle, etc., are experiencing chronic homelessness. A very interesting finding in our most recent data poll was that more females were experiencing unsheltered homelessness than males at the moment. Next slide. As of April 1st, 2020, four agencies were awarded funding through a negotiated RFP process to deliver assertive street outreach services. The agencies are the lead agency of Gateway Residential and Support Services of Niagara in partnership with Southridge Shelter, The Raft and Port Cares. Gateway was an assertive street outreach provider prior to April 2020 through regional funding and supports the team with scheduling, resource sharing, partial onboarding, and administration as the lead agency. Through the negotiation process, Niagara Region requested that the successful agencies work together to deliver service for the entire region. This collaborative approach formed the Niagara Assertive Street Outreach Team, also known as NASO. The development of the NASO team is a major step forward in transforming the homeless serving system in Niagara. We have leveraged COVID-19 to move this program along more aggressively. And we are currently working to finalize a memorandum of, of understanding amongst all agencies to formalize this collaborative. The NASO team includes 12 FTEs plus weekend outreach coverage, including two team leaders. The image on the right is just a picture of their name badge that the NASA workers wear, which they have found to provide them with credibility when establishing new relationships and working in the community. Alongside the incredible housing focused work that the NASA team does every day, the team has been successful in establishing many key partnerships. Starting in April, Niagara Falls had a police liaison officer role connected to the team. 
This officer sends referrals to NASA, the NASA team, participates in coordination and case planning, works closely with the team on a regular basis to form positive relationships with clients served and gain a stronger understanding of community. In May 2020, we launched our hotspot mapping tool as well as a partnership with 211 to facilitate referrals to the NASO team. And I will dive into these technologies next. In June 2020, we established a connection with Dr. Car Carl Stobie, an incredible doctor in our community who drops in to daily tapping calls once a week and provides support to the team for addressing client medical needs, including making appropriate referrals. In September 2020, we were able to secure another police liaison officer for the St. Catharines area. In October 2020, we partnered with our centralized after hours shelter phone line to monitor 211 referral calls after hours, which included the ability to facilitate a shelter stay or to instruct a NASO team member to follow up the next day. And in January, of this year through the support of Dr. Stobie, a two month communi community paramedic partnership was established to understand the needs of individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness in the community. And the two paramedics are able to provide wound care and assessments in the field quite promptly. Another major tool that the team uh, has implemented I apologize, I skipped ahead of myself. Okay, how does the region coordinate this outreach amongst the entire region? 211 Ontario has been an integral piece in connecting individuals to the NASO service. Anyone can call 211 for a referral and ask to speak directly with the Niagara Assertive Street Outreach or NASO team or provide enough details and their concerns to be connected to the team. The 211 operators are trained to probe a caller to ensure that they are making an appropriate referral. 211 will transfer a caller to a voicemail box that is immediately dispatched to the team to coordinate an action appropriately. Messages can be left 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And when the team is operating feet in the street, the callback time is often within one hour. In addition to the 211 referral service, the morning and day shift team meets weekdays at 8.30 via Zoom to discuss their engagements from the previous day and bring forward any challenges to seek input from the rest of their team. Bi-weekly, the entire team meets for a formal meeting, which often includes guest speakers from community resources, and monthly, a joint management committee is meets to with all agencies involved in the collaborative along with Niagara Region and all workers and people leaders from their respective agencies have access to Microsoft Teams for resource sharing and collaboration. This slide shows a screen clipping of the NASA hotline voicemail box. Through the phone line established for the NASA team, any voicemails received are automatically emailed to the NASO hotline voicemail box channel in Microsoft Teams where the NASO referral hotline is managed. Team leaders assign workers based on who's on shift and the region in which the call is coming from. Since the system emails a copy of the voicemail clip, there is less risk for information breakdown. This platform also allows the team to log each call to monitor the use of this phone line. In the last eight months, there have been over 500 referrals received. Another major tool that has been implemented with the team is a hotspot mapping system. The homelessness risk reduction solution from ArcGIS is the solution that Niagara Region and NASA modified to suit our initial needs. The licenses are $580 per year per user. In the early days, the NASA workers used this tool to map hotspots as they were learning their routes in the community. Now it is primarily used to map encampments. This platform has assisted to visualize 
areas in the region that should be prioritized for effective resource deployment. Further, the team will be using this mapping tool to support designating routes for the 2021 pit count. In terms of confidentiality and privacy, this system requires authenticated credentials to access. No client names are tracked in the system, only HIFIS ID if no one and consenting and all case management is done through HIFIS with appropriate consent. The ArcGIS solution was a quick solution for Niagara Region to support standing up for the NASO team. We made minor modifications to an out-of-the-box solution to get it up and running quickly. The reports of encampments when COVID hit were quickly difficult to track within the community. The solution provides an environment where multiple users can access and modify the same at the same time and operate on a web application and in a browser. This solution stores a precise latitude and longitude of a location and has assisted the team to determine land ownership and facilitate cleaning of an area after supporting a client to a successful we relocate to a safer supportive environment. All data can be exported to Excel to report on, as well as there's quick data insights that can be pulled through the built-in dashboard. The solution does have some drawbacks, including the difficulty, to man the difficulty to manage already submitted data points in a mobile friendly environment. It is also much easier to use on a desktop. Further tracking the check-ins and changes in activity over time as a, at a site does not seem to be a good fit for this solution. Okay, the NASA team has had many bright spots to share. To name a few, the agencies involved in the collaborative that formed in April have been so supportive and engaged in developing a strong region-wide assertive outreach program this collaborative has provided Niagara Region with the opportunity to strengthen relationships with two of our largest municipalities, St. Catharines and Niagara Falls, through weekly team meetings with NASA Program Management, Niagara Region, and the city to use resources effectively. The team has been able to partner with existing service providers to leverage each other's resources and expertise. For example, harm reduction support services, Ontario Works, Public Health, Niagara Falls Library, Out of the Cold, an ID clinic, and other previously mentioned providers in this presentation. It hasn't been all easy and the team has experienced challenges along the way. The team grew very quickly and required changes in process, including embracing technology options in order to ensure the program would be successful. The Niagara region is also very large and there's 12 different local area municipalities that all operate a little bit differently. In the early days, the team also identified it took some time to get some supply lines set up to have a steady flow of donations to support the work that they do in the community. So what's next for NASA? We have the desire to work on a phase two of our hotspot application to include more capabilities in alignment with the encampment toolkit and best practices. We'd like to see if there's opportunities to tie the hotspot mapping tool with HIFIS. And we'd like to continue to expand partnerships, improve communication platforms and awareness about NASA services. And that's a lot. So the before I wrap up, I wanna pass it off to Mackenzie, one of our NASA team members, so you can hear from him his experience utilizing some of these coordinated technology tools I presented this afternoon. Take it away, Mackenzie. Thank you, Carla. And I thank you so much for giving a snapshot on how our team has developed and, and like you're saying, had to adopt different pieces of technology. Um, reflecting on that over the past almost a year, what has been very cool, um, is, is just seeing how, uh, and this is purely with Carla's support on this aspect, it, is how um, the question, it, these pieces, these tools were never handed to us as a team. They were, um, we were listened to on what our needs and what the barriers of helping our clients were. And 
these were the solutions that were found and adapted to to assist us as outreach workers, but um, ultimately assisting our client. So thank you so much. Um, on that point, what what has been so interesting to me as outreach and ASO worker over the past year has been seeing how significant um, and, and yeah, just how, how big a factor our use of technology is in, in our job. Um, so that's what I, I would hope to do in this couple minutes is just touch on those pieces of technology and how uh, I am using them day to day and our team is using them. Um, you know, I, prior to, to starting, I thought the job would have focused a lot more on basic needs and some really great granola bars and water bottles. Uh, and don't get me wrong, we've handed out countless of those. Um, but the, what, what feels like the most productive and most helpful stuff to the client is, is providing access to the uh, coordinated access model that we have and by names list. Um, so it's, it's that piece of information and, and communication that seems to be the, the key to accessing the supports available uh, within our homes and services system. Um, so that's, and that's, like I said, that's true more than ever with coordinated access. Um, it's the flow of information and communication with various partners like agencies, um, fellow teammates. Um, we Carla mentioned a number of healthcare providers. So uh, as outreach workers, uh, we're, we're no stranger to working with what we've got um, and just having to make it work uh, because a lot of things are unpredictable in that environment. Um, our team has evolved, like I touched on, um, evolved and grown and Carla and team with the region has uh, helped that and been alongside the whole way, uh, relentlessly asking for feedback and how the tools uh, that we are being equipped with uh, are helping helping us and helping us accomplish our work for our clients. Um, so to get into those, let's see on this slide, um, like Carla explained, the call comes in on 211. I am able to view that on Teams uh, on my phone. Uh, some workers use tablet, uh, laptop. Um, and then we, uh, sorry about that. Um, We'd go on site or call the person back, get further details for location, um, can map that location. This is a snapshot of that uh, ARC uh, GIS system or, or the mobile friendly version uh, that can be used to enter a new point for an encampment. Um, if a client is not there, uh, our team has developed this uh, calling card. Uh, it explains what resources we have available. We can write in services and uh, phone number available for, for a worker, uh, hoping that we still get in touch with that client, even if they're not available at that time. Um, and then from there, uh, maybe we do meet the client, we're able to begin some case management. Um, that's where HIFAS, you're able to share case notes through HIFAS. Um, you'll see, I have a picture of the bottom here, I have fallen into just using the laptop in the car. Um, if not at the car, uh, phone, using phones, one of the two phones. <laughs> Um, one for work and one for looking up things on, on HIFIS or other internet is very useful. Um, I have found that when we need information, we need it right away uh, to make sure we take advantage of the opportunity we have with our client. Um, it's finding being, you know, having clients at the right time uh, is one thing, but then having the support available at that time as well is, is sometimes you just have to to take advantage of the opportunity we have, right? So that is where um, maybe coordinating together uh, case management, talking to teammates, uh, other agencies, that's sharing case notes on HIFAS comes into play. Um, but then access to community resources, uh, that's where technology tends to be one of the greatest uh, assets. Um, often there's always um, just some legal aspects to things where you need consent sometimes agencies, we all want to do our job properly. And so sometimes an agency that I need to speak with or advocate with uh, for my client uh, requires maybe a consent. Uh, if I'm not with them, we are taking photos and, and sending scans of documents like that. Um, yeah, so I realize I've 
uh, spinning wheels a little bit here, but um, this is all just to highlight uh, just how much of an asset uh, tech is in our day to day and, and making um, the job more efficient and more effective. We would work with whatever we have um, in the interest of our client, but ultimately without without these pieces of tech, they have made us incredibly more efficient and effective at, at having the information we need at hand uh, for a client and being able to um, to make things happen or available for our clients when they are ready for them and, and when they want them. Um, it, in that way, we can try to always hold the door open uh, for them for whenever they're able to, or willing, ready to, to choose that one or walk through it. So yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to, to hear just a snapshot of what we're doing in Niagara. I was very excited to share today. Thanks, Mackenzie and Carla. That was so great. I'm, I'm thinking people are going to have lots of questions. I certainly love these pictures. Like it gives you a real sense of like some of your materials and Mackenzie, kind of what your car looks like as you're on the road. And um, yeah, really helpful and well explained. Thank you to both of you. So Lisa, I am seeing that there are uh, some questions coming in, which I'll get you to ask. Ian's putting some reflections in the uh, in the chat there, but yeah, I, I invite reflections from the panelists to each other, and and we'll also address those questions that are coming in. Lisa, are there, are there things that particularly struck you, or that you also wanted to highlight? Um, yeah, I I wanted to highlight that uh, both communities seem to be using a GIS tool with different levels of. Of success, you know, definitely some challenges in being able to use that tool outside of HIFAS, so mainly using HIFAS or another way to log your case management notes, um, and then kind of hopping on to a different tool to be able to use the uh, GIS function and map where you're finding folks who are sleeping rough. Um, and this connects to a question that we had from uh, Robin. She was wondering if anyone could speak to HIFAS and outreach. Um, they're thinking of joining GIS and HIFAS in a separate database, but wondering if anyone else has a better HIFAS solution um, for kind of tracking and using um, the information of where you're seeing people sleeping rough. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if uh, Carla or Mackenzie or Malcolm, if you could speak to that. I think this is a perfect question for Carla or, or Mackenzie to answer. In our early days, we did explore trying to utilize HIFAS to capture you know, locational data, but the challenge with HIFAS is it's all tied to an individual. So we know that sometimes when the outreach workers would be encountering sites that the sites would be vacant and confirming who was where would be challenging so we had we might be able to capture some data that way but not everything and this is maria i'll just add in like i think you know this idea of how we can more optimally use uh hyphus for outreach um Diversion and outreach were both identified as areas that could use strengthening and Acre uh, Consulting right now has been working uh, and may have reached out to some of you in communities around uh, your thoughts and ideas around how uh, HIFAS could be improved for diversion and when that project is done the next area to turn our attention to is outreach to offer some uh, recommendations and thoughts to the HIFAS uh, team. Uh, so just so you know, that's kind of on the radar as an area that's recognized that could use strengthening. And so um, there'll be opportunities, I think, uh, Ali will be reaching out to people in the future to ask for their thoughts on how outreach could be improved in HIFAS. And uh, Lisa, so was there another question there as well? Yeah, so also have a question, um, just asking the panelists of their experiences using the outreach data and their outreach teams to meet the housing needs of people uh, with very high acuity or complex needs who are unsheltered. I 
I can take a go at it. Uh, so we've been able to have our information integrated into HIFIS. So when we are filtering to prioritize for programs for our through the by name list, we've been able to filter through COVID that unsheltered uh, individuals ex experiencing unsheltered homelessness as their last day would be prioritized. So through HIFIS and understanding their BI spadats, um, we've been being able to make offers that way. Yeah, I would, I would find that would be true um, for me as well. So for higher needs clients uh, or, or higher acuity clients, I, those ideally are also often the clients higher up on our by names list. So, um, and it feels like there aren't many options available to a client uh, with the way we have it set up, like Carla was saying, by documenting um, the high acuity client and, and the factors, um, you know, that, that lead to them in that situation. Uh, I have confidence that that is, a, you know, their application towards the housing first, home for good, you know, the, the resources that might best support them. That's great. Uh, Malcolm, anything you want to add there? Unfortunately, we, d we don't have a system in place for tracking that information to be able to share it across outreach teams. So at this point, that's something that we're trying to work towards at the coordinated outreach table to be able to coordinate our uh, efforts in the community based on um, different factors. Uh, acuity and, and, and needs would be two of those factors. Thanks. And Ian, um, if you want to unmute yourself, I, I know you're chatting and some sort of key takeaways, but would love just to, yeah, hear you share reflections and what you're sort of seeing with outreach across Canada. Thanks, Marie. First, just let me say what a phenomenal job uh, the panelists have done today. Uh, really, not just insightful, but inspiring uh, on what's possible. So some key takeaways for me in this were the use of data to drive, understand, reflect, and improve. Um, really making sure that outreach isn't just going anywhere and everywhere, that it has an aim, and that aim is directly related to trying to find safer, better alternatives for people, including housing. And so that focus on solutions, I think, is really clear. Uh, and I also really took away this idea of reflecting on a practice and continuously improve practice. Uh, that was a big takeaway for me, uh, and I think something where we're seeing, uh, certainly in the presenters talk about this, this idea of, of, you know, we tried some things, we took up some things, um, uh, we made amendments to some things, and we keep moving forward as opposed to thinking you just, you know, get it perfect. I love the response table that uh, Malcolm talked about in Kelowna, my words, the response table, but that, that collaboration coordination piece that is going on in that dialogue that you've been able to really set in motion that's really structured on accountability. I really love that. Uh, and I also really loved uh, in the Niagara presentation, this kind of acknowledgement that they have a huge landmass to cover, but that through use of technology, uh, in some ways, my word's not yours, it gets smaller when you have data not the landmass gets smaller, but where you focus your time and attention and how you're even planning on using that for some of your point in time count work moving forward. Really strong takeaways uh, for me. I love um, the space of reflection on outreach practice because I think we're seeing that this isn't just about mobile coordinated access points, although uh, certainly not taking away anything from that. And I think that's remarkably important, but also really embracing this idea of coordinated passage through to allow for coordinated exit. Uh, big takeaway for me, it wasn't just about engagement, it's about solutions. Those are my initial thoughts. Wonderful, thanks for sharing that, uh, Ian. Really appreciate you listening in and kind of summarizing all of that together. Agree, like panelists, you just did such a super great job and we really appreciate it. We're just going to, like we're getting ready to wrap up here. Uh, we're going to monitor uh, just any last questions that are coming in, but I also have a short poll for you folks to answer that I'm just going to launch now. It's three quick questions just to give us some feedback on the webinar. We'd really appreciate that. 
Um, again, we will be following this up with uh, uh, email uh, with the recording and the PDF and a, a, a bit of a longer survey to get your further input on upcoming sessions that uh, topics that we could be providing that sort of thing. So you could be watching that in your email. Um, any last questions, Lisa, in there before we wrap up for today? I do have one more uh, question. Um, Robin's wondering if other communities are also experiencing sort of a pushback um, from housing providers or housing first programs um, serving very high needs unsheltered folks. And I'm wondering, I feel like that's really a question to everyone. I encourage folks to use the chat if you want to chat further with that about Robin, with Robin, um, leave your email or uh, if you have a comment to make about that. Um, but yeah, to, oh, yeah we are seeing some others put in the chat that they're having similar experiences too. Yeah. You're not alone, Robin. <laughs> something definitely to connect and, and talk more around around sort of uh, how to do that. And I'm seeing people putting in their emails to, again, chat more uh, amongst yourselves, which is part of the hope with these uh, community practice calls that people are getting connected together, learning what others are doing, and uh, can also continue the conversation offline. We are at the end of our time today. Um, I'm seeing people say, yes, I have so many questions on this topic. Such great presenters. Uh, the presenters' emails are included in the presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that's okay, Carla and Malcolm, if folks follow up with you, if they have further questions or want to dig a bit deeper into anything you shared today. Absolutely. Feel free to reach out via email and we can uh, connect offline. Happy to chat. That's great. Uh, so again, thank you to our presenters. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for co-hosting, Ian, for joining us, and for those really insightful reflections at the end. And we hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thanks, and bye now.